I'm, I'm honored to be here and just pumped to, uh, to tell you some stories. Uh, you know, my, uh, I don't have any kind of a written speech out. I have a lot of stories I want to uh, touch base with you uh, or tell you about. And then it's my hope that I'll leave time at the end that you can ask me questions uh, so that I can you know, respond to what it is that you want to hear about or what you think I might be leaving out uh, of this story. Uh, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm going to run through quite a few what I just call uh, vignettes uh, of things I've learned uh, uh, through the years. Uh, and you know, I'm going to start off as, uh, you know, uh, as, as a teenager. You know, uh, as a high school kid, uh, you know, living in Tomball outside of Houston, Texas. Uh, and um, I'll say that, you know, uh, I grew really quickly in business. Uh, and a lot of people ask me why in the world or how was I willing to take such big risks? And, and you know, uh, uh, how did I pull off all these things? Uh, and as I look back at that, I, uh, I look back to my high school years, uh, and I would tell you that you know, I went through drug uh, rehab twice uh, in high school, uh, and uh, you know, once as a sophomore, uh, uh, you know, as, as soon as I got my car, you know, I got freedom, and I was off to the races, you know, uh, you know no pun intended. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was uh, a, a challenge seeker, I was an adventure seeker, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's just say I was having a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, my, uh, my parents caught wind of it, sent me to treatment, uh, I, you know, I went through treatment and then I went to a halfway house in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for all summer long. And then I came back to Tom Ball for my junior year of high school, uh, about three months uh, uh, there. Long story short, I got back into it uh, and uh, I got busted again by my parents and shipped off this time to Oklahoma City. Uh, and, you know, I started kindergarten when I was six. My birthday's in August. They had the choice of what to do. So I, you know, I started kindergarten when I was six. We decided as a family that it was, I was better off not to move back to Houston. So even though the family was all in Houston, you know, I decided to uh, stay in Oklahoma City. So uh, as a senior in high school, uh, I was my own legal guardian in Oklahoma City and I got an apartment in Oklahoma City in whatever school district I chose to go to. And, uh, you know, it, that wasn't a big deal to me when I was a kid. Now that I've had kids that have all, you know, been through that, it blows me away. You know, I, I, I can't imagine either of my children uh, being, you know, in a different state, their own legal guardian, living on their own for their senior year of high school. Uh, but that was me. And, uh, uh, you know, it, I look back on that time very fondly. I'm sure my parents don't, uh, uh, but I look back at it as a very, uh, a very fond uh, time. Uh, and I believe that that extreme independence that I had at a really early age kind of established me as being different than everybody else. Uh, I had comfort being different than everybody else. Uh, and I had comfort that, you know, uh, I had comfort in betting on myself. I had comfort in my work ethic. Uh, uh, and uh, it just kind of set the tone for me for, you know, not only my whole college career, but my whole professional career, maybe even uh, my whole racing career. And so I look back at those times you know, quite frankly, I look back at my kids' times and I feel like I have fallen short because the, it, life has been too easy for them. You know, uh, every time something gets tough, I tell my wife, don't worry about it. You know, they need these rough times. Uh, uh, but I feel like those times for me uh, were very 
uh, uh, you know, uh, forming of my willingness to be independent and willingness to be on my own and confidence in you know, uh, my ability to uh, be successful. Uh, it, it, so uh, that's kind of where it starts. Uh, I'm gonna go off on three racing stories uh, 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 with a little theme to the story and then uh, a, a few business stories. But, you know, it, it, Kyle talked about Lamar. Uh, you know, I've been, you talked about the you know, Ford versus Ferrari movie. I feel like I have lived that movie. You know, in 20, in the last six years at Le Mans, uh, I have been on the podium five out of six times. Uh, I believe that every car in that race is a long shot. I don't believe, believe like there's anything as a favorite because in each one of those years, there have been at least 25 cars in my class. And uh, there's so much out of your control that, you know, over 24 hours, anything can happen. Uh, and I feel like there, uh, it's unreasonable to expect that you're going to do well. Uh, and it seems outrageous to me that we've done that well. But in 2018, I got third place in Le Mans in a Ferrari. In 2019, uh, I got the opportunity to, I'm a third generation Ford dealer. So I, I grew up as a Ford dealer's son. And I, my first dealership was a Ford dealer. My grandfather was a Ford dealer. He had five kids, four of them became Ford dealers. So we grew, I grew up with extremely deep Ford roots. And you know, I, I grew up as a racing driver driving Vipers. Uh, uh, and uh, so it was a big deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm cutting to the chase here and saying it was a big deal when Ford came to me and said, you know, we would allow you to buy one of our four our factory racing four gts if you race it at le mans uh, it was you know the price was way too high uh, it was outrageously expensive but i chose to do it because of all the deep connections that i had uh, with ford and uh and so in 2019 uh, I, I raced the ford gt and uh you know i'll just say that the the aco is the governing body for the 24 hours of le mans uh, they had a rough history with Ford, you know, back a few years earlier in, I think it was 2016, uh, it was the first year that the new Ford GTs had come back. They won Le Mans uh, uh, based on uh, playing the political game. They were way faster than all the other competitors. The ACO felt burned by them from four years earlier. And so since that time period, they'd slowed them all down. And so the Ford GT was not the fastest car there. Uh, and so going into the race, I did not feel like we had an opportunity to win. And so we were trying to do every last little marginal gain that we could, uh, uh, we could have. And you know, now that the program's dead and gone, I can kind of tell some of those stories. But, uh, you know, the... Uh, the ACO uh, gives you a certain amount of fuel allotment, and uh, we were allotted 96 liters of fuel in our fuel cell. A fuel cell is a metal box with a rubber bladder inside of it, uh, and we were allowed 96 liters. Uh, we'd set up our engine during all the testing to burn as much fuel as possible. So the computer was burning as much fuel as possible. Every way we could burn fuel, we were burning fuel because we knew the ACO was measuring it and that's what they were gonna give us fuel mileage based off of. And uh, uh, when we got into the race, we, uh, 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 we, got, we got really lean. When you run the engine leaner, you get more power. So everything was good. We had more power we were, uh, and we had more fuel capacity. But the reason that's important is because Ganassi, who had worked with Ford on this particular car, had designed a fuel cell that filled really quickly to uh, 90% and very slowly for the last 10%. And we were only you know, uh, required to be stopped for long enough that a full fuel, when they plugged in the fueling rig to the car, full fuel took 35 seconds. Uh, you know, during the race, we were not fast enough necessarily. We didn't have the speed to, to win the race on speed, but we were slowly creeping up to the front 
because our pit stops were slower than everybody else's. Uh, and they were slower, I'm mean, sorry, faster. We were about six seconds faster than everybody else. Uh, uh, and the ACO didn't know why. Now I can tell you that we were only putting in 90% of the fuel uh, uh, that we needed in the tank because now that's all we needed to be able to do our 14 laps. And so we were making six seconds up on every single stop that we came in on. But according to the way it looked to the ACO, we were breaking the rules. Uh, and so uh, you know, I'm gonna cut to the chase and say, miraculously, based on our strategy, we won the race. Uh, and so our first win in 2019 uh, uh, it was in the Ford GT. Uh, it was super special. I got to celebrate with Bill Ford and Jim Farley and, and it was just a really special moment for us. I flew home on uh, leaving on Monday uh, uh, or Sunday night and arriving back at home on Monday. Uh, and I got a call when I arrived at Houston Intercontinental Airport that said, I'm sorry, Ben, but they've just disqualified the car. Uh, and so if you've watched the Ford versus Ferrari movie, uh, you remember, you know, uh, Ken Miles wins the race and, you know, he held back for the photographic opportunity when they crossed the line. And at the end of the race, they say, well, you, you know, you didn't really win because the other guy traveled further because he started further back. Anyway, you know, uh, 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 nobody understands how he feels the way we understand the way he feels. You know, uh, uh, you, you had the, you know, I think of the, I think it was ABC Wild World of Sports when I was a kid. You know, you watch the, the ski, the skier, you know, wreck going down uh, the slalom where they talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. You know, that's how I felt. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, kind of the, the, the moral of this story or the theme of this story is everybody in the racing world, especially in the Ford world, and, and none more so than Bill Ford, felt like the, the, uh, the French were out to get us. Uh, it felt like this was, you know, retribution for uh, still for what Ford did in 2016. Uh, and uh, it, 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 they were really angry. Every time the media interviewed me about it all, uh, I did not feel that way. Uh, and the reason I didn't feel that way is because uh, I was involved in the engineering decision to put our fuel cell exactly at 96 liters. Uh, you know, uh, our engineering team wanted to uh, leave a little margin for error in the size of our fuel cell. I didn't feel like we had any margin to give because we weren't fast enough. And I made the decision, or I was part of the decision to set it right at 96 liters. Uh, we were disqualified because during the race, our fuel cell expanded by, you know, I think this is 500 milliliters. It expanded by about that much of what I have left, of 400 milliliters. So we had 96.4 liters in the tank. And the rules, before we started the race, the rules clearly say, if you have more than 100 milliliters, more capacity at the end of the race, then the penalty is, di is disqualification. I was part of that decision. The rules were made before the race. They might have been out to get me, but if that's true, we made it way too easy for them. Uh, uh, and so it was really easy for me to take ownership of that disqualification. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's kind of what I take from the 2019 Le Mans experience. It was an incredible experience on Sunday. It was an unbelievably hard experience on Monday. Uh, but uh, it, it, I don't have a problem with it. And uh, it, it's mostly because uh, I'm able to take ownership of the decisions that we made and what happened. You know, I, I don't feel like, you know, uh, anybody was out to get me. Uh, interestingly enough, I had a really difficult Daytona 24 hour race this year. Uh, and uh, I felt like we made, you know, my team made a big uh, strategy mistake in the middle of the race. Uh, and, you know, we had a, a heart to heart after that uh, race 
where I, I, I explain to them that I'm really into that type of stuff. Uh, and I'm a, I think I'm a really good resource. And uh, I wish they would have talked to me about that uh, because, you know, I might have made the same decision we, that you guys made. But if I'm a part of the decision that I get to take ownership of it, if, if you don't involve me, then it's all your fault. You know, uh, uh, so uh, it was just a nice opportunity to be able to take ownership of that tough situation because I was involved in the conversation. Uh, fast forward to uh, uh, 2022, uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans. Uh, and um, you know, uh, you know, 2019, we won in the Ford GT, got disqualified the next day. You know, uh, 2020, I, I did Le Mans in a Porsche. We had a terrible race. Uh, 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 2021, I was in an Aston Martin. Uh, we got second place, uh, and we were, you know, uh, I'll just say I feel like we were unlucky uh, uh, in getting second place. In 2022, I was in an Aston Martin, and uh, 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 we thought we had really good speed. We qualified uh, in, in qualification, hey, just so I can help kind of monitor my timeline. Uh, when did I start? How much time do I have? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I'll just say we, I won't go through that story. I'll say we qualified 19th. Uh, nobody has ever won Le Mans from as far back as 19th place. Uh, and uh, we felt like we were going to be fine because we felt like we had the speed. We felt like we had left enough speed in our, in our back pocket. Uh, and so when we start the race, there's this big game playing that goes on uh, before the race. Uh, everybody's hiding speed. And we felt like we were doing a better job of that game than everybody else. And so we start the race thinking, okay, we're going to be fine. Uh, in the top seven cars that started that race, there was one Porsche, uh, and by the end of the fifth lap, the top six cars in that race were all Porsches, and we all went, oh no. You know, uh, the Porsches played this game way better than anybody else, and they were two seconds a lap faster than any other brand of car in that particular race. Uh, and so, uh, uh, at the beginning of the race, we felt like we've got no shot. Uh, and you know, we kind of had a little huddle among the team and just said, hey, all we can do is control what we can control. Let's just put our head down, do the best laps we can do and not make any mistakes, don't get any penalties, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, throughout the race, uh, miraculously, one by one, Every one of those Porsches made a mistake, uh, uh, had got a penalty, you know, had a mechanical, uh, went through the gravel. Uh, even with three hours left to go in the race, uh, you know, I had done the calculation. You know, we were winning, we were in the lead with three hours to go in the race, uh, and I had done the calculations. I was in the car, you know, driving, racing around the track while doing all this math in my head. Yeah, you know, there were two Porsches that were, uh, uh, you know, one was 30 seconds behind me, one was 40 seconds behind me. Uh, we were doing about 15 laps per hour. They're two seconds a lap faster than us. It's pretty easy to say that, you know, if there are three hours left in the race, they're gonna pass us. You know, I was looking at it going, the best we can hope for in this race is third place. Uh, even with three hours left to go, even though we were leading and, uh, you know, I got out of the car with one hour left to go in the race. And I look up at timing and scoring and, uh, you know, we're in first place by 39 seconds. And I'm, you know, I'm, you know everybody's, you know, congratulating me on what we've done. I'm going around going, what in the world happened? Well, it turns out, you know, that one of the Porsches, the Porsches were, even though they were fast, they were difficult to drive. and. Uh, Trying to catch up to us in the Aston Martin, one of the drivers had made a mistake 
uh, and take a big trip through the gravel and they had an unplanned pit stop as a result. Uh, the, uh, the other Porsche had a mechanical gremlin, uh, an electrical gremlin that popped up at the end of the race uh, and they had to come into the garage and fix it. Uh, and so uh, long story short, we ended up winning that race uh, which was a huge deal for lots of reasons. Uh, uh, you know, uh, number one, because we didn't think we had a shot. Uh, uh, number two, because for me personally, you know, uh, it, it was a little bit of redemption on 2019. Uh, you know, not, not redemption of getting back the series for screwing me because I didn't think that's what had happened. That's the way the media portrayed it. But for me, it was uh, redemption in improving to myself that I belong to be there. You know, uh, that the first one time wasn't a fluke, uh, uh, but uh, what really was special about that win that year is that we didn't win on pace. We didn't win on speed. Uh, we won because we did everything in the right way. Uh, uh, we had a clean race. We had no penalties. We had no mistakes. We had no bad pit stops. Uh, it, it was an incredible, team win and it's one of those deals where you feel like if you do everything the right way you ought to be rewarded and that's one of the only times in racing where i can say i feel like man we won the biggest race in the world because we were rewarded for doing everything in the right way uh the the, the big story there to me was that we did well just on the areas we controlled what we could control we can't control what the other teams are doing. We can't control the speed of the other cars. And we're just like, don't worry about them. Just do what we can do and do the best job we can of it. Uh, and it was an incredible win for us. Uh, based on those results, so as you know, I'm a car dealer, I'm a car racer. I've always tried to race what I sell. I don't sell Aston Martins. I was very successful in the Aston Martin. Uh, uh, we won the world championship in 2022. Uh, and Le Mans there, and so it was a great car. They really wanted me to drive for them again, but based on the results uh, in the Aston Martin, Corvette Racing came to me and said, hey, you know, uh, what about driving for us next year? Uh, and it was a big deal for me to be able to race something I sell. Uh, you know, uh, you know, even though they speak English at Aston Martin, it's the Queen's English, you know, it, 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 and, uh, it, it's nice to talk to somebody on the radio that sounds like me. Uh, it's nice to race with an American team and an American car, an American you know, uh, uh, flag, national anthem. Those kind of things are just special. Race for something I sell. So I switched to Corvette in 2023. Uh, uh, and uh, as Kyle already alluded to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go to the end and say we, we won the national championship last year as well, world championship last year as well. Uh, 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 I'm not going to talk about it, but I'll say last year was probably the best year ever for me in racing. I won the national championship in the LMP2 class in IMSA as well. But in the Corvette, we won the world championship. Uh, we ended up winning the 24 hours of Le Mans uh, uh, in last year in 2023, second year in a row. Uh, and I don't have it set up. I kind of wish I would have, you know, I, I still get choked up when I see it, but you know, I, I have a selfie on the podium. I still get choked up about it. Um, of uh, winning Le Mans, uh, listening to the Star Spangled Banner under the American flag with 300,000 uh, people from all over the world there watching. Uh, just an incredible, obviously emotional uh, experience to do that. Um, and, you know, Cal talked a little bit about it. You know, it was a fun year for me because the bronze driver, so every driver in the GTM class is rated bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. Every car in that class has one bronze, one silver, one either gold or platinum. And I'm the bronze driver, which just means I'm the old guy. Uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, you know, the, can't remember why I started on that story. Uh, 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 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, it, it, but, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was a big deal for me uh, 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 to, to, to go through, uh, ah, I do remember. Uh, so this year was the first year that the bronze drivers got to qualify the car. Uh, and I qualified the Corvette on the pole uh, uh, in the 24 hours of Le Mans. So big deal, big celebratory thing. We're starting up front. And as Kyle already alluded to, we had a damper or a shock failure in the first 60 minutes of the race. Uh, the first hour of the race, it took us 10 minutes to fix that, which doesn't sound like much. It was really quick and it is really quick, but we went two laps down. And if you look at the history of Le Mans, nobody has ever won uh, from two laps down. Nobody has ever recovered from that. Um, and you know, significantly, I'll go back to the previous year, nobody had ever won from starting 19th place uh, and, you know, we miraculously achieved that in 2022, you know, uh, going back and looking at 2023, uh, I remember standing up in front of the video screen in hospitality in front of timing and scoring and explaining to everyone in the room how we're currently running 17th and it's mathematically the best we can hopefully, you know, possibly hope for is to get 12th. It's mathematically impossible to do any better than 12th. Uh, and, uh, you know, long story short, my older eyes don't see very well at night. So the strategy is I don't drive at night. Uh, uh, the strategy is uh, I'm not as good as my pros driving in the rain. And uh, so I don't, I, I, I prefer to not give up time or drive in the rain. Uh, it, it, I'll say that uh, uh, you know, I drove a little bit before it got dark on Saturday and uh, it, I, you know, it, uh, various different things happened throughout the race. But you know, uh, I'm going into an area called the Porsche Curves uh, you know, it, 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 and you know, you, most of you, I'm confident, are not familiar with what I'm talking about here, but it's a super fast corner. You approach it in sixth gear. All you do is brush the brakes, downshift to fifth, and you turn in. Your minimum speed on that corner is about 150 miles an hour. And I'm on slick tires with no grooves. Uh, and I, I, I come, I'm approaching this corner. And as I'm approaching this corner, it downpours rain uh, and uh, 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 you know, uh, I'm not, I might have literally prayed out loud. Uh, uh, I, I, I was scared to death at this moment, but most of the Lamar track is on public roads and this is where the public roads transition to the you know, dedicated track. And so uh, I made the decision to not turn. I made the decision to stay straight and stay on the public road and stay in the middle where you got the crown of the road because I'm on slick tires and I wouldn't have any grip. Uh, uh, and I slowed, you know, so I went off track, went straight where they have a nice long runoff period and slowed down the car really, really slowly, turned it around and tiptoed back to the track. Uh, and and I, I felt devastated as a driver uh, because I'm looking at the, you have a predictive lap on your dash. You've done the lap so many times, you know where you're supposed to be. And I'm looking there and I have just cost the team 15 seconds uh, in the car. And I thought, oh, this is disaster. You know, uh, it, and I felt really, really bad. I got on the radio and said, guys, you know, please get me out of the car. You know, this is really bad. We need to have rain tires on. I want out. Uh, I just felt really bad about what I had just done. I got out of the car uh, and I looked up at the television screen and they were showing a replay. <clears throat> four cars behind me, all four of them tried to go make that turn and all four of them went into the wall one after another, you know, and ruined their race. Uh, it turns out I made a really good decision. Uh, uh, and, you know, that type of thing happened a lot throughout the race. 
uh, uh, of the 27 cars that finished the, that started the race, I think only 11 cars finished the race. There was more attrition, uh, uh, or you know, D DNF did not finish uh, uh, in that race than any other Lama that I'm aware of, uh, and so. One of the ways that we did so well uh, is that a lot of the cars that were fast, a lot of the cars that were in the lead uh, uh, didn't make it to the end. Uh, it, but you know, I, had, I did not understand how we got to the front. I did not understand how we, uh, how we made up two laps, how we, how we got to the lead. You know, because I was either driving or sleeping. But either way, I was not paying attention to what was going on in timing and scoring. I literally had to go home, watch the race, follow timing and scoring step by step to figure out what in the world happened. Uh, and uh, what happened is that one by one, uh, everybody had some sort of a problem. Uh, we got one lap back being lucky as a result of a safety car. Uh, we got one lap back, uh, uh, you know, so I've already talked about my strategy of not driving at night. Um, uh, I went to bed at midnight after giving my, you know, uh, hospitality, all my guests a big, you know, discussion of how we weren't going to do well. They should all go to sleep. I also went to sleep at midnight. At 1 a.m., they came banging on my door and said, we need you in the car right now. Uh, I, I didn't know what happened, but I threw on my racing clothes and ran down there and got in the car uh, at 2 a.m. Again, realizing that this is way off strategy. I'm not going to be on pace. You know, uh, why in the world am I in this situation? I don't know, but I'm just going to do my job. Uh, and um, turns out Nico, uh, who was a 22-year-old guy from Argentina, when he woke up at one to get into the car, walking downstairs, uh, uh, you know, uh, fainted, passed out, blacked out in the stairwell, fell down the stairway well and was unconscious. Uh, 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 so they sent him to the medical center uh, and they needed a driver. So, you know, uh, uh, I got in the car. I drove from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, and... Uh, you know, asking on the radio, you know, what in the world happened? And they're like, you know, just don't worry about it. Just drive. You know, they're telling me I'm going to get out of the car at, at 5 a.m. I'm like, who's getting in the car? Is Nico, is Nico okay? Yes, he's good to go. He's getting in the car. So the strategy was for me to drive uh, most of my time on Sunday morning. Uh, I, I had proven that that was the best strategy uh, uh, in 2021, 2022. Uh, and so most of the other bronze drivers were also doing the same thing. Nico was lightning fast. He was one of our fastest guys in the car. And as it worked out, because of weather, uh, uh, because of attrition, whatever re different reasons, I had done pretty well of keeping pace in, from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. Then in the morning, on Sunday morning, that's what, at Le Mans, that's what they call happy hour. Uh, because it's when the air is coolest and the track is coolest and when it's cool uh, the cars have more power and they're faster uh, the track has been raced on for uh, a long time you know 20 or, I'm sorry 15 hours or so already and it gets what we call rubbered in the pavement gets rubber on it and the track becomes faster and it becomes daylight so you can see what's going on take a little bit more risk and so that's happy hour. That's when the fastest laps are done, usually is on Sunday morning. And uh, so uh, Nico, one of our fastest guys, was in the car versus all the other bronze drivers who were driving in the morning the way I was supposed to. Uh, and we literally drove back a lap, which is about four minutes, uh, uh, by Nico being that much faster than the other bronze drivers and them having to do six hours of drive time and he just murdered them uh, and, and so uh, uh you know the uh, uh it, kind of the lesson you know, uh, it, i'll talk about a, an earlier lesson many years ago 
I, I made a mistake at the 24 hours of Daytona and, and we were leading the race and I felt I was devastated. I felt like I had made a big mistake. Bill Riley was running the team for me uh, and he pulled me aside and he said, listen, you know, uh, uh, today, yes, you might be able to look back on that and say that you made that mistake. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to make a bad strategy call. Uh, and it's going to be my fault that we didn't win the race. You know, uh, a month later, it's going to be a mechanic that, you know, uh, that trips and falls and, and, you know, doesn't have a good pit stop that costs us the win. Uh, but this is a team sport. And, you know, we win as a team and we lose as a team, period. There is no one person that cost us this race today. Uh, and that has stuck with me a long time. Uh, uh, and as I think about that experience of winning at Le Mans last year in 2023, uh, that's what I think of. When I thought to myself, uh, my gosh, I just cost us the race because I cost us 15 seconds, uh, 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 you know, in lap time, um, yeah, I, I, I think back on that. I think about how we ended up eventually winning it, uh, and you know, I would say, you know, uh, uh, you win as a team and you lose as a team, uh, and you know, uh, therefore, it's not about me. You know, uh, it almost seems selfish for me to be able to look back on it and say, oh my gosh, I cost us this race. Uh, uh, it's also selfish to say that we won because I did well in the night or I qualified on the pole or any of that stuff. Um, uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, it's absolutely uh, not about me. You can't do it alone, which is exactly true about my business and all of your businesses, any organization. You can't do it alone. Uh, you win as a team and you lose as a team. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is true in success or in failure. Uh, uh, but it was true for sure in our success that year uh, in Le Mans. Uh, so, uh, you know, in business, a lot of times, uh, my people will hear me talk a, a lot about the idea of a comparison. You know, uh, I'm a very competitive guy. Uh, uh, I'm always uh, uh, talking about the comparison with my team. Uh, you know, uh, I like to tell the story. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but or some version of it. But I like to talk about two hikers hiking through the forest. They come into an opening in the mountains. They look across there and there's a big bear. And the bear stands up and he looks at them and you know, starts coming towards them. One hiker takes off his backpack, starts taking off his boots and putting on his trail running shoes. And the other hiker says, what are you doing? That bear can run 35 miles an hour. You can't outrun that bear. And the guy says, I don't have to. I only have to outrun you. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, it, it's important to know what the comparison is, what the goal is. Uh, and I'm always talking about those types of things in my business, in my life. Uh, and, you know, uh, when I think about uh, uh, why did I choose the car business? Most people think I chose the car business because I'm a third generation Ford dealer. I'll tell you that you know, as a kid, I worked at Tomball Ford uh, uh, from the time I was 11 till I was 16. Uh, and my job was parking cars in a straight line, picking up trash and washing cars. That's it. Uh, and I'll say that that's all I knew about the car business. And I hated it. I wanted nothing to do with it. The fact that I grew up in the business meant that I wanted to go as far away from that as possible. Uh, so I went to Texas A&M and got an engineering degree. Uh, I chose engineering because I was really good at solving problems and not very good at writing papers. Uh, uh, and so I just decided that was the way to go. Uh, uh, and I was going to do something other than the car business. Um, I ended up doing an internship in between my junior and senior year for an insurance company that 
that, that did a lot of business with car dealerships. Their in for doing business with car dealerships was training. Uh, and so I ended up going through, you know, part of my internship was being a fly on the wall, you know, the, the making copies or whatever with the trainers as they went into a different car dealership every week all summer long. Uh, so I spent about six weeks of my summer, not the whole internship, but about six weeks of it was going in and out of car dealerships. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'll... I can now easily admit that I was, you know, uh, uh, full of myself and a know-it-all college kid. I felt like I knew something uh, it, when I really didn't. But uh, as I went through each one of these dealerships, I uh, two things that are important. Number one, uh, uh, these guys were making pretty good money, uh, uh, and I'd never, you know, I'd never been privy to that. I never understood that, you know, uh, owning a business or being in a car business, uh, uh, it had, you know, you could make that kind of money. And number two, most of these people, almost all of the people that we were going in and, 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 and working with, I thought they were doing a terrible job of running their business. Uh, I knew that the business was super competitive uh, and, you know, all of my dad, my aunts, uncles, all they talked about how, was how tough it was uh, and how competitive it was. And I'm looking at this as a know-it-all college kid and saying, you know, these guys are doing a terrible job of running their business. Uh, this does not look tough to me. You know, I can run circles around these guys because I can run the business better than they can. Therefore... This just looks like a giant opportunity. And that's what made me decide to get into the car business. Uh, and I'll say that I got into the car business all based off the idea of the comparison. That, you know, uh, 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 I felt like I could outrun the other hikers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I ended up telling my wife to get a job anywhere USA. She went to work for Dell. I'm already out of time. Not yet. Uh, she went to work for Dell Computer in Austin, and I went to work selling cars at a Ford dealership in Austin and uh, grew from there, uh, and it's been an amazing ride. But it kind of goes back to what I talked about in the beginning of being willing to be independent, being willing to bet on myself, uh, uh, you know, betting on my work ethic uh, and my ability to outrun the other hikers. Uh, you know, I would say that for me, in business or in racing, and maybe in life, you know, I have approached life from the standpoint of being a problem solver. Uh, uh, to me, you know, uh, that's what life is about. Uh, it is you know, whether it's you know, business, school, you know, uh, relationships, whatever. Uh, I'm always looking at the world as a problem to solve or you know, a, a way to build a better mousetrap. You know, I, I, I realize now that I've got notes on the back of this. I wrote this morning, you know, about, you know, the title of it is Build a Better Mousetrap. Uh, it, you know, a uh, uh, totally different topic. Uh, yeah, this is the meeting I'm going to have when I get back to the office. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, that's just the way that I have uh, uh, viewed the world. And, uh, you know, I, I, Sometimes I'd call it just being a student of the game. Uh, and, you know, uh, the way I grew so much when I first got started was being so heavily involved and being a student of the game, trying to figure out how to build a better mousetrap. And I really feel like when I first got into the industry, I first became a manager in the car business in 96. Five years later, I got the opportunity to buy a small Ford store in a town of 10,000 people that had gone broke twice in seven years prior to that. Nobody wanted it, so it was really, really cheap, uh, and I didn't have any money. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, any long story short, put all that together, and a big reason for our success was that I had always made these kind of notes you know, all through my career of, you know, 
uh, what's wrong with the way we're currently doing it, it. If I was going to do it differently, what would I, you know, if I was going to do it myself, what would I do differently? And I, I, I built a model that didn't exist prior to that. Uh, it does now everywhere. Now I kind of feel like we're all old school. But uh, you know, the back then it was all new and fresh from the idea of the way we were advertising, the way we were you know, uh, 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 you know, aver you know uh, handling our pay plans, handling our approach to the customers. I mean, everything about we, the way we approached the business was new and different uh, and uh, uh, you know, I feel like we had built a better mousetrap uh, and done a great job of problem solving. Uh, and, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I, being the keynote speaker here, I'm not obligated to give any kind of a plug to Max Connect, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but I will uh, because, you know, uh, uh, I think it's interesting, you know, uh, to say that, uh, you know, uh, I own my own ad agency. Uh, and the fact is, I do a ton of business with Max Connect, and, and uh, the reason I believe for that, and uh, the reason why it's different, uh, and the reason why, why I've grown so much with them, the reason why I believe Max Connect has grown so much through the years, is that it's, it's almost, it's a very similar story to the way I grew uh, in Port Lavaca, uh, in that, you know, uh, from my perspective, their approach into the market uh, of advertising, their approach in uh, their pay plans, their approach into the market, their approach to their clients uh, it, it is just different. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it, I love that idea. I, I, I love building a better mousetrap. I love problem solving. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know I, in the interest of time, I'll stop there and just say, uh, I, I think that, you know, Keating Auto Group and Max Connect are very well aligned just on that idea of, uh, of, of being competitors, loving a challenge, uh, and uh, always trying to you know, build a better mousetrap, but <clears throat> I'll stop there and say, I'd love to talk about what it is that you would love to hear about. So, yeah, sure. Who? Uh, 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 so <clears throat> there are a lot of them. The first thing that comes to mind for me is that, as I said, I did not have any money. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, uh, when you buy a car dealership, you have to, you know, come up with a certain amount of equity, operating capital, those kind of things. You have to prove to the manufacturer that it's unencumbered. Uh, uh, you know, the fact is I borrowed 300 grand from my grandfather uh, 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 and, uh, I mean, I guess I, I'm comfortable admitting it now, but I, uh, uh, I took it to Crosby State. I took it to the local bank. I opened a CD with the money on Monday. On Tuesday, I went in and went to the bank and said, hey, I need to close out the CD. I opened uh, the very next day, 24 hours later, uh, uh, and I, uh, per, you know, I, I sent that paperwork to the manufacturer and said, you know, uh, I had that 300 grand in a CD and I closed it out yesterday so that I could do this deal and there's the proof that I closed out the CD. It's all true. I didn't lie, really. Uh, 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 but, um, you know, I was basically 100% leveraged uh, on the first seven dealerships that I bought. Uh, uh, not, that's not really true. The first six dealerships I bought. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we were enjoying great success. Uh, and a lot of that was we were selling a lot of cars. The manufacturers owned, they had what they would call a captive finance arm. So uh, because we were so successful at selling cars, they were willing to loan us a lot of money. Well, uh, the significant thing that happened was, you know, 09, uh, 08, 09, 2010, the credit crunch, you know, uh, 
uh, five of my stores were either GM or Chrysler. Uh, they both went bankrupt. Their credit arms went bankrupt. Uh, and nobody would give a car dealer a loan because it seemed like a really bad bet, a really bad risk. I remember where I was standing in 2010 when I got the call from, you know, uh, you know, Ally, the, the you know, uh, Obama, the, uh, the car czar put all that business into Ally Bank as a federally regulated bank to try to save the industry. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, mean, I just imagine they had a giant pile of folders and every time they got to mine, they, oh, and they put it right back to the bottom uh, because they didn't know how to make my file fit. Uh, uh, but I, I remember where I was sitting at 2010, in 2010 when they called me and said, I'm sorry, but there's nothing we can do for you. Uh, uh, you know, basically saying, we're pulling the plug. Uh, you're broke, you're done. Uh, uh, and, you know, I can tell you lots of stories that are similar to this. Uh, uh, it, but, uh, you know, I was devastated for about an hour. Uh, and I called them back up and said, you know, uh, what if I came up with another million dollars uh, and, you know, uh, uh, again, really shortening the story. It's a great story, but uh, I don't have time for it all. Uh, you know, uh, 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 ended up putting a deal together with them that, you know, uh, their response to me has been, we've been through all of your financials and you don't have another million dollars. Uh, and I said, that's beside the point. What if I could come up with it? You know, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the, the, the answer is that I had to come up with another $3 million. Uh, and uh, 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 we got really creative, I would say, in the way that happened. But uh, that is probably the darkest and toughest moment I can think of in business. Yeah. I mean, so you could fit in a thimble what I know about car racing. I think you just filled it up. So my thing when listening to you was trying to discern your appetite for risk. My perception is you're willing to put it all on the line. The fact that you leveraged everything in the beginning, do you still think that way? Or has yeah. your appetite for risk changed over time? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, I, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, so I was, uh, 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 I was unemployed for six months prior to buying Port Lavaca Ford, and I didn't have any money. Uh, I was unemployed because I was fired by my father, uh, you know, which is a totally different story. You know, all the money I could save went into buying stock in the company. I own 20% of Tomball Ford. He said, you're fired, and, and I don't care what you do with your stock, but I'm not going to buy it. And so all the money I could save went into that stock. And so it was an ugly situation. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, on several occasions in my life, treatment being one of them and that time period being one of them, I've been at the bottom. I've been with, you know, I, I've had nothing. Uh, and what I've realized in those moments is that uh, uh, it's all going to be okay, you know. Uh, and uh, another way of saying that I've been at the bottom and had nothing is a way of saying I had nothing to lose. So uh, there's no difference between having nothing and having nothing to lose. Uh, and you know, at that point in time, when people ask me about taking risk, I would say. You know, I've, you know, I think of the old Janis Joplin remake of me and my Bobby McGee. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, uh, it, it, I understand that more than most people uh, uh, because I have been in that situation where I've had nothing left to lose. And that gives you tremendous freedom. Uh, uh, and so I was willing to take a lot of risk early on. I had nothing to lose. Uh, I, I, I had been to the bottom. It's not that bad. I have faith in my uh, work ethic, my ability to, uh, 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 to figure out how to make ends meet. I'm going to be okay. Uh, and so that's why I took all those risks. Now, in business, I've built it up. You know, we've been amazingly successful. Now I have a lot to lose, right? And so you know, and now I have to be a little bit more calculated with those risks. 
uh, in business. Uh, but uh, again, I really, I, I love the structure that we've built. Uh, and part of that is a CFO that says, hey, you know, every time I could get any amount of money po po pieced together, I'd buy another one, which meant 50% more debt and, you know, and, and giving away all my equity. Uh, and so I had, a, uh, a, I had a history of doing that. My CFO eventually said, hey, you know, time out. You know, you need some rainy day money. You need some money that's not tied to the car business, uh, uh, it, which we've done through the years. But uh, we've developed a cushion. We've developed a more uh, conservative approach than we have had in the past because we've got a lot to lose now. Uh, and with regard to racing, you know, we could debate this for a while, but I don't feel like it's, it's that risky. Uh, I, I feel like it's less risky than than mountain biking. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I've had a lot of wrecks, but you know, everything about the racetrack is designed to handle a wreck. Everything about the car is designed to handle a wreck. Everything about, you know, I've got all the safety gear you could possibly imagine. Uh, uh, you know, there is a medical team stationed all the way around the track uh, I've had some big incidences. I've broken bones. You know, I've had some big, ugly wrecks. Uh, but it's been a long time uh, uh, since uh, someone has died racing cars. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, yeah. to me, it feels safer than mountain biking. You know, uh, you know uh, it feels uh, it almost feels safer than, you know, than 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 driving around Salt Lake City because everything is everything that we're doing is designed to keep the driver safe. Uh, and, and so it just doesn't feel that risky, uh, even though every decision that you make as you're trying to race at the limit, you're trying to pass other cars. Everybody's trying to go to the same spot. Everybody's got the same goal. Uh, yes, there's a lot of give and take. There's a lot of risk in each of those little moments. Uh, 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 but overall, you know, it, when I go to a race, uh, it doesn't feel like I'm risking my life, you know, uh, is what I would say. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Uh, like Great. The, uh, my impression is that what GM accomplished with this car is pretty incredible given its, its price point, its performance, especially in the class that it sits. Can you add to that? Can you validate that being your experience with the other cars? You've yes. So, uh, you know, uh, I sell 16 different brands of cars. You know, uh, you're supposed to love all your children equally uh, 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 is what I would say. Uh, and so I had the I had the Texas Viper owners at my uh, office and my garage on Saturday. Uh, you know, once a year they come and, and you know, uh, so I've got the car uh, that I won Le Mans and the world championship in sitting in the lobby of my office. Uh, I, I got it a week ago. Uh, 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 and, uh, and I've got, you know, some Corvettes in the garage, uh, alongside lots of Vipers and this is all Viper owners and, you know, various different things. But, you know, they ask me to, you know, talk about the difference between the cars, uh, uh which is, you know, uh, uh, I'll come back to that, uh, to try to answer your question specific to, uh, specific to Corvette. Uh, you know, I'll say uh, as a road car, uh, you can't help but totally agree with the statement that you made. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, uh, uh, you know, design wise, uh, I, I think anybody would be hard pressed not to agree that it is competitive with any of the, you know, uh, uh, you know, any, you know, 10 different luxury, you know, sports car uh, brands out there. Uh, 
uh, uh, it's, you know, from a, from a performance standpoint, it's really, really incredible. But what's really incredible to me and to most of the consumers out there is the price point that you talked about. You know, it's, it's half the price of most of those cars, uh, uh, which makes it an unbelievable uh, uh, value. Uh, uh, from a race car perspective, it's a little bit different in that, um, you know, uh, the car I'm racing, you know, looks like that car, uh, uh, but the fact is it's a tube frame completely built from the ground up as a race car. And uh, it, it's just, uh, it, it's unbelievably ridiculous uh, on, uh, uh, on the things they have done to make that car as competitive as it is. It's a fine, piece of machinery is what I would just say. I mean, it's, you know, I could, you know, uh, even having all the Viper owners there on Sunday, uh, Saturday, I mean, I, you know, I, I took off a lot of the body parts and I talked about all the little things that they did to that car that make it special uh, because it's very special. Uh, 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 you know, a lot of that stuff is, you know, they try to bring it over into the road car. Not a, a lot of it is not necessarily, you know, realistic, uh, uh, but a lot of it does transfer um, you know, a, a, I would say that, you know, on the track, you know, uh, you know, they were asking me about Viper versus Corvette. And I would say if I'm, if I'm going on a, a drive on the road, I way prefer the Corvette because the Viper is, is, it beats you to death, uh, uh, going down the road. Uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you're shaking your head. My wife hates riding in a Viper with me. Uh, 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 it, you know, she, she loves to drive the Corvette. The Corvette's just, uh, it's, it's an easier animal to tame, I would say. Uh, I think that if I'm going in a drag race, I think the Corvette and the Viper are really, really good, but I think going in a straight line or punching it and, and feeling the rush of that car, uh, uh, you know, is incredible. Uh, on the racetrack, uh, you know, I, 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 I greatly prefer the Viper. Uh, uh, of course, you know, that's irrelevant now. They don't make it anymore. Uh, uh, but, and, you know, and I'm mostly referring to the, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, C6 or C7. You know, I have not driven a C8 road car on the track. Uh, uh, but, the, you know, um, uh, yeah. I should just cut it short and say what they've done with the C8 is pretty incredible.